She's perfectly fine with insulting people who already plan to vote for Trump because they're unreachable anyway. She's looking at the people who are on the fence and who may not really know quite how bad it could be. And to um, to call a spade a spade, uh, it really does represent a fashy sort of thing, this, this Trumpism. Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. Well, we range from center left to center right. Not that big a political spectrum, but that's where we like it. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at The Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of The Wall Street Journal and the Brookings Institution, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center, and Damon Linker, who writes the Substack newsletter, Notes from the Middle Ground. Our special guest this week is New York Times columnist Ross Douthat, who has frequently been praised on this podcast by Damon Linker, who frequently <laughs> cites his uh, his columns and gives them special attention. So we thought it's only fair that we hear from you directly. Plus, people have been telling me that we don't differ enough on Beg to Differ. So maybe we can get some differing going on where we stand with just a few days until the 2024 election. Ross, I have a feeling that even though you really dislike Trump, maybe you're not quite there in terms of being able to vote against him. What, am I, where, where do you stand on all that? Um, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's always pleasure. a pleasure to, to join any Bulwark podcast. I'm a, I'm Thank a faithful, you. faithful reader of all, all <laughs> Bulwark, almost all Bulwark content. And I'm glad to hear that Damon has such nice things to say about <laughs> me on my group chats. My group chats are all very anti Damon Linker. I should say it's like, you know, every week it's like, Oh, that guy, that guy again. Um, but so it's good. It's good that, you know, Damon doesn't, doesn't take that personally. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess the way, you know, like, I guess, like most people associated with the bulwark, I was an anti-Trump conservative from the start. And there are a lot of ways to be an anti-Trump conservative. You can, you know, vote for the Democrat running against him, but you also can abstain. You can vote third party. You can write in Mitt Romney. You can vote for Evan McMullen and deeply regret it. Not that I know anyone <laughs> who ever did that. Um, but I, I think what's what's definitely true is that no matter what version of, you know, anti-Trump conservatism you subscribe to, in the end, to be an anti-Trump conservative is to have some degree of comfort with the idea that the Democratic alternative is is going to be president, right? Hillary Clinton, you know, maybe you don't vote for Hillary Clinton, but there's some degree of acceptance, some degree of acceptance if you don't vote for Joe Biden that, you know, by being anti-Trump, you're sort of accepting that. And I don't really, you know, I don't think I'm not big into endorsements and I honestly haven't known how I'm going to vote uh, before walking <laughs> to the voting booth in many elections, even before Trump came along. Um, so I don't have like a spiel about how I'm voting. But I don't think anyone who reads my columns would be surprised that I have less comfort with the idea of a Harris presidency than I did with the idea of a Biden or a Hillary Clinton presidency. And that obviously colors my my attitudes in, in the election. I, I am I, th I see a lot more a lot more bad in acceptance of what Harris and the Democratic Party right now represent than I did in 2020 and 2016. That's sort of where I stand. Okay. Um, I, I have to give you fair warning that your colleague Brett Stevens was on this podcast a couple of weeks I, ago. I, I saw that. I, and, have, I didn't listen, so I don't know what he said. So, but. you know, he at that point, he was on the fence as to whether he was going to vote for Kamala Harris and after we got finished with him, just a few days later, he oh, announced that he was voting for Harris. <laughs> oh man! Well, then I had a, you know, I didn't, I didn't See? make that connection. So, but I've really, I'm, I'm afraid I'm having technical difficulties here, Mona. I'm gonna have to, <laughs> gonna have to drop off. <laughs> the power of beg to differ. All right. Well, um, uh, let's let's get into our our 
first topic today because it's highly relevant to everything that we've just been saying about what the stakes are in this election. So this week we had the extraordinary uh, phenomenon of Trump's former chief of staff, Marine General John Kelly, um, giving lengthy interviews both to The Atlantic and um, The New York Times, including on audio. Why is that so important? Well, you can pull the audio and make ads out of it. Um, outlining just how awful he thinks Trump is as a human and as a potential leader, and he used the F word fascist. Um, this dovetails with comments from Mike Pence, James Mattis, Mark Esper, John Bolton, Mark Milley. I mean, it's a very long list. Um, and yet what we are seeing from the uh, Republicans is dismissal, uh, treating it lightly, saying uh, my favorite was um, uh, Chris Sununu, who said, well, that sort of thing is baked in with Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Linda, I'm going to, I'm going to start with you, um, is, uh, so which part of this, uh, surprises you, if any of it, uh, the well, fact that Kelly got there or the fact that the, the Trump people are simply saying nothing to see here? Uh, none of it surprises me. Uh, I expect it all. I mean, I joked, uh, probably shouldn't repeat it, but I will, uh, with, in a chat, uh, with some of my family members that, uh, Donald Trump could molest a 12 year old boy on stage at one of his rallies and his people would be with him. I mean, it's just amazing to me. Um, how hard and fast, what concerns me. And it does, I mean, listening to Ross it does concern me. Uh, he is somebody I've respected over the years, um, most often agreed with, um, particularly on religious issues. Um, what concerns me is that people seem to think that policy differences, of which I have major disagreements with uh, the Democrats and with Kamala Harris, somehow trump the basic issue of um, whether or not we are about to elect a man who has no respect for the Constitution, uh, who has demonstrated his willingness to break the law, uh, to uh, ask his uh, minions to do illegal things in his name, uh, had to be held back by his Attorney General Bill Barr and others from prosecuting uh, his enemies list um, and how that isn't the only issue that matters when you go into the to the voting booth. Um, I think that John Kelly's uh, statements were, I'm really glad he made them. I think they were very help helpful. Maybe there'll be a few Republican women in the suburbs who will say, okay, well, I can't, you know, I can't vote for Trump uh, because of this. But I don't think it's a game changer. I don't think it's, it's the October surprise that some people were looking for. And the fact that Ross could still not know who he's going to vote for after hearing everything and knowing everything about Trump really concerns me. Uh, Ross, I'm going to leave. I'm going to let you off the hook. You don't have to respond to that just yet. I'm going to uh, bring. Why don't uh, you let Bill. the others have a piece of me first, and then <laughs> then I can, you know. <laughs> well, you can prepare. Um, so, um, Bill Galston, you know there are a lot of theories about this. Some people think this is not helpful. Um, Brett Stevens, who we mentioned a minute ago. Um, uh, and all, and our own Damon Linker have written saying this isn't really helpful to have not not the Kelly part but the uh, but but Harris repeating the the epithet fascist it's unhelpful. Brett says you're insulting people who are going to vote for Trump. Um, I, I let me present this to you. Um, she's perfectly fine with insulting people who already plan to vote for Trump because they're unreachable anyway. She's looking at the people who are on the fence and who may not really know quite how bad it could be. And to, um, to call a spade a spade, uh, it really does represent a fashy sort of thing, this, this Trumpism. And so why, why, you know, treat it with kid gloves? 
How do you respond? Uh, well, I respond as a weary realist, you know, who's been in and out of uh, presidential politics now for more than four decades. Uh, and I would, I would answer it with a distinction. There are two different questions. Question number one, is it true? Question number two, is it useful? I think among reasonable people, it's going to be hard to dispute the truth of the proposition. Uh, the question of whether it's the right way for her to close out the campaign is a different one altogether. Uh, and I think the art of politics is saying things that are both true and useful. And I'm not, I'm not sure that she has found the right close, although I have to tell you in all candor, I'm not sure that she hasn't. You know, I think at this point, given our ignorance about the nature of the people who have, haven't yet made up their minds, whether to vote at all, and if they do, whom to vote for, we should all say that this group that's hard to reach is also very hard to understand. And we should not make glib assumptions about what, if anything, will move them. So that's my answer. Okay. So, Damon, I already, uh, I know what you think about the, um, the, the wisdom of making this, uh, this accusation, and we'll come to that in a second. But I want to now circle back to Ross, because, uh, because Bill said there are two questions, the first of which is, is it true? Um, what what do you think the answer to that question is? I mean, I think that, you know, there's, I, I think it's absolutely clear that um, Donald Trump has an authoritarian temperament and personality. And much of what Linda said, describing his habits of thought, desires, temptations, what he would do as, you know, a chief executive unconstrained are all true. And we have, you know, I think we have plenty of evidence for that that is, you know, much more material than him saying something about Hitler's generals to John Kelly that I think was already reported a couple of years ago. Um, so in that sense, you know, on the practical political question that Bill raises, I'm skeptical that this is some sort of dramatic novelty. People contemplating the choice in 2024, lots of people who, you know, I know personally who are conflicted on the issue already agree that Trump is an authoritarian. Now, fascism, you know, the reason people raise fascism as opposed to using terms like authoritarianism is that fascism conjures up a particular kind of authoritarianism that's, you know, the worst kind by general agreement in all of history. You know, I, I don't I don't think we need to litigate that to sort of say that Trump is is bad on, you know, well, on these hey, fronts. On. Right. Can, but like, can, can, but, well, but wait, if wait, you know, I have to interrupt. I have to interrupt. It's not just that that's the worst thing you can say. And that's why people are saying it. Mm -hmm. um, believe me, uh, it, during the course of my long career, I've been called a fascist many times. It's a, it's an epithet that people like to use against right wingers. That doesn't make it true. But the reason that Trump invites it is, first of all, he attempted to stage a coup. But second, he uses language like no, the no, enemy no, I, within I, I, and vermin and poisoning the blood that we have very good reasons to associate with fascism. No, j just to be clear, I'm not I'm not saying that the people using the term don't have arguments for why they're using it. It's just not. But there is also a sort of like, you know, if, if you conjure up Adolf Hitler, you aren't just conjuring up, you know, using rhetoric like the enemy within. You're conjuring up the Holocaust and the invasions of innocent countries in Eastern Europe, right? I mean, obviously, like, these things go beyond sort of a mode of rhetoric. There is an invocation of specific policies, crimes, and horrors of the 20th century that's inherent in that in that conjuring, right? And this is, I think, part of why 
from a political perspective, it somewhat falls flat because Trump has already been president, right? Like if you say, you know, Ann Applebaum in The Atlantic just wrote a piece where it's like Trump is talking like Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini. OK, but then the argument is we already had Hitler, Stalin and Mussolini as president for four years. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are nostalgic for aspects of those four years. So where where does that leave the argument? Right. I, I just think this is this is the. This is the challenge, right? You're, yeah, you're trying yeah, yeah. to conjure no, up. The, the, the point of calling Trump a fascist here is right. Is not just to say he uses dehumanizing rhetoric. It's to say once he's president, he will do the kinds of things that Benito Mussolini did. And people have a tough time fully accepting that argument because he was already president. And did right. something okay. genuinely know, terrible Bill, on January Bill 6th. And Linda, Bill but, and Linda okay. desperately want in yes, here, yeah. but Damon hasn't spoken okay. yet. So, Damon, over to you. Uh, why well, I feel bad to derail what could be a true beg to differ smackdown moment here. Um, <laughs> so actually, I, I will I will defer to Linda and Bill and come okay. back to me at okay. the end and let me speak for fifteen uninterrupted <laughs> minutes. Uh, just just kidding. Yeah, but, Fair okay. enough. Okay, B Linda, I'm going to ask you to hold off because Bill sure. had his hand up first. Sure, Ross, I take your point. You know that there are a bunch of really bad things that Trump didn't do during his first term. Uh, but I hope you'll take on board my point uh, that Trump was constrained from acting out on his worst instinct in all sorts of ways during his first term that he will not be during his second. Uh, as, as we now know, he was surrounded by people, especially on the defense side, but also his chief of staff who were trying to pull him back from the brink and did so with some success. There were less visible staff people, you know, who were trying to delay or deny presidential decisions that they thought were unwise by even going so far as to take pieces of paper off his desk that they were afraid he would sign if they stayed there. Uh, the evidence is that in his second term, he will not be surrounded by restrainers, but rather by enablers. He was dissuaded from difficulty, just to give one, with difficulty, just to give one example, from invoking the Insurrection Act in 2020. Who is going to tell him no this time? And I'm not making this example up. You know, he has threatened to invoke it early in his, early in a second term. So why am I wrong to fear in the second term what we did not quite see in the first. Let me get my point in. You can respond to both of us because, uh, frankly, he has told us that he is going to round up 11 million people who have lived in the United States, most of them for more than a decade, some of them for more than 20 years, nearly all of them uh, in families in which there are U.S. citizens in that family. He has also said, that it's going to be bloody. That is what he has promised. And if you can get closer to an invocation of things that happened in the 1930s, I can't think of it. And talking about the enablers that Bill referred to, Stephen Miller has even said that he is going to ship these people across country on trains in order to invoke fear in that community. That is pretty concrete and pretty scary. So to Bill's point, I think there are quite good reasons to worry that Trump will be less constrained in a second term. And those are excellent reasons not to vote for Donald Trump and not to wish him to be president. Um, on the specific point about uh, the border and deportations, I am skeptical that you are going to see an effort on anything like the scale that Trump has promised. There are reasons that people around him, including his running mate, J.D. Vance, who presumably will have some influence over the administration, have talked about, you know, the things that a normal effort at deportation would end up doing, prioritizing, aiming to deport criminal aliens first, these kinds of things. 
there is large scale support, political support for some kind of increase in deportations driven by the fact that we have had a massive increase in illegal immigration over the last four to four, four years. And I think it's completely plausible to look at that landscape and imagine Trump doing something that, you know, people who oppose deportation would naturally oppose, but that is well within the normal history of American immigration debates. I think there's a big difference between Trump desiring to imitate, you know, the deportations of the 1950s, which might be a terrible and wicked idea, and saying that that's the same thing as the Holocaust. I think that's honestly an absurd comparison. They're not even, you know, these are not, these are not, you know, Dwight Eisenhower was not Adolf Hitler. Like, this is just not a reasonable thing to say. But I completely concede Bill's point that there are going to be areas where Trump is going to feel himself less constrained if he wins a second term. That's absolutely true. Um, I, I think I should say something, though, about the question of who Trump is running against in this election. Uh, and I want to go back. I think it was Linda who said earlier that you don't understand how, given that Trump has these authoritarian tendencies and doesn't have any sort of you know deep belief in the restraints of the American Constitution, how any policy difference could possibly motivate someone to not cast a vote for his opponent, right? I, I assume that all of you are arguing of an affirmative vote for Kamala Harris, right? This isn't even like, you know, voting third party and these kind of things you guys think is a dereliction of patriotic duty. That's um, right. So on those points, I, I don't think it can possibly be true that no policy difference could motivate voting for someone who is unfit to be president, Right. If you had credible reason to think that Kamala Harris's foreign policy would lead swiftly to a nuclear war with Russia, even if she is a completely well-meaning person who believes in the Constitution, you might look at that landscape and say, well, four more years of Donald Trump, definitely preferable to a nuclear war with Russia. I don't think you can make that kind of case exactly, but I do think from my perspective, something substantial has changed in my understanding of American liberalism and the Democratic Party over the last five to 10 years. I would say if you go back to 2016, when we all started out, well, Damon was always a, you know, a, a Democrat, and so was Bill, but Linda and Mona, right? We all started out as never Trumpers, never Trump conservatives. At that point, my view of the Democratic Party and a sort of institutional liberalism was that you could, it, it could get things really wrong. I disagreed with institutional liberalism about a lot of very serious issues, but you could trust it not to go crazy. And that was a really good reason to prefer institutional liberalism to Donald Trump. You couldn't trust him not to be crazy, but you could trust Hillary Clinton, again, to do things that were bad and wrong and, you know, make policy mistakes, but were sort of within a range that I considered sane and sensible. I don't have that feeling about liberalism anymore. And, you know, we're in a moment where there's sort of a narrative among sort of, you know, centrists who are opposed to, you know, progressive or woke excesses in the last five or six years who will say things like, well, you know, we, you know, uh, we, we all agree that these things were bad, but, you know, a bunch of, you know, people being people being stupid on Twitter and, you know, some college professors getting in trouble and, uh, you know, some people saying abolish the police, defund the police or whatever, you know, and stuff with bad, but it's just not commensurate with the actual policies that the Trump administration, you know, would, would support. And to me, as we have moved away from what we think of as sort of peak woke, right, this sort of, frankly, I think, deeply insane period that American liberalism went through, to me, the further away we get, the worse that period seems, and the more the more seriously destructive, it seems to me. We passed through a period where sort of, you know, a sort of insane turn against policing and normal operations of criminal justice contributed to the unnecessary deaths by homicide of, let's say, 15 to 20,000 Americans. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of dead people. I think you can add in a lot of dead people in, you know, in road accidents and vehicular homicide. I'm sorry, not vehicular homicide, but, um, you know, traffic accidents, these kinds of things that were also a creation, yeah, not of a, a single Democratic politician, but of a crazy mood in liberalism. 
I think you can look at, you know, the data, the, you know. Wait, how was, how were the traffic accidents? I, I, I don't understand. There was a wild surge in ratless driving and traffic accidents in the COVID era that I think is also reasonably linked to the retreat of police from the nor from normal operations. But oh. um, in, okay. in in that period. So okay. again, like that's that's not, you know, a bunch of kooky college students. That's a lot of dead American, a lot of, you know, American a lot of yeah, a serious and concrete effect of policy. I think you can say something similar about the, you know, the reckless misuse of medical science to uh, treat gender dysphoric youth in ways that, you know, the New York Times, my own newspaper, is admirably reporting on at the moment that led to not deaths, but thousands and thousands of, of young people essentially being medically experimented upon with puberty blockers, chemical castration, surgery, and so on. Um, that again is an actual concrete cost of where I think again I think many of you agree liberalism went a little bit you know a little bit crazy in recent years. Um, I don't want to I don't want to multiply examples, but I think I think you I think you get my point, right? Sure. And yeah, and I think you can say something similar about the landscape of foreign policy. I've been pretty sympathetic to a bunch of the decisions the Biden administration have made, the specific decision. Case by case, you know, I, I don't I'm not someone who's condemned every move Biden has made around Russia and China and the Middle East. But overall, the Biden administration foreign policy has been a crashing failure in terms of maintaining peace and security around the world and maintaining the American position around the world. And the Trump foreign policy was much more successful. That's just a basic reality that, again, is linked to lots and lots of dead people and the threat of more dead people around the globe. So I just want to put those ideas into the conversation because I think they might be helpful in thinking about like how, I, you know, most American voters are not me. They're not like a New York Times columnist. Most American voters are more concerned about inflation than any of these issues. And I don't think the likelihood of inflation under Kamala Harris is a good reason to vote for Donald Trump for various structural reasons. But I do think things have gotten bad under liberal policy making, liberal cultural attitudes, and Biden administration policy to a degree that actually matters for a discussion about the effects of having the different parties in power and how much you can trust a figure like Harris, who is, to make my final invidious comparison to Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton, is frankly a lightweight and incompetent and someone who is not as good at politics as Joe Biden not as smart and experienced as Hillary Clinton. And therefore, if I'm looking ahead four years and saying, which of the, which between Donald Trump and his likely foreign policy team and Kamala Harris and her likely foreign policy team, which one makes a war over Taiwan more or less likely? I don't think it's at all a slam dunk for Kamala Harris. Not at all. So anyway, that's okay. You, you guys all wanted right. some meat. There's some meat. There you go. Okay. Thank you for that. And now a word from one of our sponsors. Uh, your personal data is out on the internet uh, and it is uh, vulnerable to scavengers who can gather everything from your name and aliases to, the, to your social security number. But Incogni can protect you. It keeps your personal information secure uh, and guards against even the most sophisticated online threats. The, this cutting-edge service doesn't just fend off pesky data brokers, but also expertly handles any objections they may raise. And if you've got a circle of friends or family who could use some added protection, Incogni's plan allows you to include up to four additional people, all benefiting from the same high-level security. Head over to incogni.com to start your journey to a spam-free and secure online experience. Plus, with a 30-day trial and a full refund guarantee, if it's not to your liking, there's no reason not to give it a go. Take your personal data back with Incogni. That's I-N-C-O-G-N-I. Use code beg to differ and get 60% off an annual plan at incogni.com slash beg to differ.
Ah, oh, Damon, so much there to, to, <laughs> to, to talk about. I mean, and, and, you know, there are things that I agree with Ross about and things that I don't, or I, I would put the balance of equities a little differently. I mean, I certainly on the transgender stuff, I think harm has been done. Um, but, uh, but I don't think Ross gives enough, um, weight to some of the dead people who didn't have to die during the COVID. Uh, crisis because of terrible leadership and uh, abdication by Trump. But anyway, we're not going to get into that now. Maybe we'll come back and do another one. But Damon, you are entitled to a chunk of time. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I can justify that leeway with brilliance and entertainment for all. Um, I do want to circle back briefly to something that actually I don't think on the podcast we've ever explicitly discussed, at least not unless it was a week when I was absent. Um, this question about dereliction of duty and voting for Harris. I actually don't consider it a, a duty to vote for Kamala Harris. I think a vote for Donald Trump affirmatively is incredibly foolish and irresponsible. But I'm perfectly content if a fellow citizen who is a genuine believing conservative who believes in certain policies and principles tied up with however they understand conservative conservatism to mean if they say look i cannot vote for kamala harris she is she is a progressive i don't believe her in all of her flip-flops vis-a-vis 2019 to now i can't do it if they just say i'm going to stay home or i'm going to vote third party or whatever, I don't care. I, I mean, I, it deprives Trump of a vote. That that's important. Now it doesn't. Fifty percent of a fifty percent. Right. So it's fifty percent dereliction. No, not exactly. I mean, I actually can. I consider that perfectly fine. I. It's the, the place I would in my imagined morally uh, balanced and uh, and lucid reality of my brain. If a person says, I won't vote for Trump, but I can't vote for the Democrat, I say, good, I'm glad you're not voting for Trump. That's the important thing. And depriving him of a vote is is significant. I don't, I mean, I, I, that that's where I come down at least. And I wanted that to be on the record um, because I have friends like this and and I, I, I hear their arguments and I I don't feel like I should have to try to convince them uh, of something that I only half believe, which is that Kamala Harris has really changed, that she actually can be trusted to be the person she's campaigning as now, as opposed to the one she was campaigning as in the primaries in 2019, where, frankly, if she had been that person taking over from Biden, I don't know if I, I mean, I think I probably would have held my nose and voted for her this year, but I very well could imagine, depending on how that unfolded, that I'd be in the position of saying, I'm not voting for Trump, but I can't vote for her, because her version of, at least the 2019 Kamala Harris version of of progressivism is is quite far from the kind of centrist liberalism that I believe in and and not forever as Ross indicated but since roughly 2004 uh around the time he and I started fighting about uh people like uh Richard John Newhouse and first things and so forth but I was a I was a, a you know believing republican voter back then um and I I haven't you know I I wasn't thrilled about John Kerry, but I voted for him in 2004, and I happily voted for Obama twice and for Hillary once a little more ambivalently because of various things, but I didn't really worry what would happen if she were president. Um, and then Biden was a no-brainer. That was easy. Uh, but Harris circa 2019 would be a lot uh, that would be asking a lot, and I'm not certain I could have gone all the way there. But I could. Ne I will never vote for Trump. Now, briefly, just to get it on the record, as if anyone cares about the record here, but. Um, you know, Trump and fascism, I, I've, I've generally been, uh, open to this, you know, having this debate. Uh, I like and have plugged John Gantz's work on this podcast. He's very strong on kind of the Trump is fascist line. I think I, I find him often, uh, quite 
persuasive on this, but I also think he also would concede some of the things that I would say that like, it's one thing to say that Donald Trump fantasizes in his mind that he could be a Hitlerian ultra competent dictator and everyone would love him and cheer him and all of this, but that's a fantasy. He had, he was president for four years. It was an incompetent, uh, mess and, and, uh, you know, fascism is more than just one guy's uh, d deluded fantasy life. It's it is a, a a total mobilization form of totalitarianism, and there is no way that the United States in 2024 is going to fall in behind Trump the Fuhrer. It's far more likely, as I have said and worried about in public for like eight years now much more likely that we are going to have Trump trying to act like a dictator, perhaps, and I think probably most likely around surrounding the whole deportation thing um, with him invoking the Insurrection Act in response to violent protests about the the attempt to round up people in their homes and in their neighborhoods and take them away from their families, asking for papers and putting them on trains, these kinds of things. Um, if he does try things like that, which, as I think Linda is correct in saying, he's indicated he and the people around him are indicating they would like to do that. If he tries it, there will be big protests. And if there are big protests, he will invoke the Insurrection Act. The Republican majorities in Congress that he might have will not do anything substantial to stop it. And in that case, that doesn't mean we have fascism. That means we have, if you'll excuse uh, the language on our family podcast, we would have a shit show. A total civic shit show where you have a kind of hapless would be fascist in the White House constantly playing a kind of cat and mouse game with millions of angry protesters. And then in between them, troops who have been called up and deployed under the Insurrection Act and where that goes. I don't know, but it's nowhere good. I wouldn't call it fascism, but it sure is a mess. And it's my case and has been for quite a number of years now, the kind of the baseline reason why Trump is just totally unacceptable. He is, he has, as the great Jeb Bush once said, a chaos agent. That is his primary role in our politics, not Adolf Hitler. He's, he's the guy who's going to tear the country apart in the worst case scenario. And I think that's certainly bad enough. Uh, because, you know, in the end, I guess I'm, I'm kind of a, a liberal Hobbesian <laughs> in the sense that, yeah. that you can't have, you can't, if you don't have a certain baseline of order, no other good things in politics are possible. And Trump is dangerous because he threatens precisely by acting like a dictator. He provokes the exact madness that Ross rightly denounced in the 2020 period. Wait, right. Ross, I'm wanna, sorry. Can I, but, can I, be, can I? Well, before you do, let me just let me just sum up um, uh, the the argument as I see it about policy differences versus um, sort of existential threats to our system, because um, because I, I've given this some thought and I wrote a piece a while back saying that um, I, I had to confront in 2020, in the early uh, months of the primary season, what I would do if the campaign came down to reelect Trump or elect Bernie Sanders, because Bernie Sanders was ahead in those early primary contests. And even though I am about as uh, as diametrically opposed to Bernie Sanders as it's possible to be, I had to conclude then, and I would still say today, I would vote for Sanders over Trump because I do not think Bernie Sanders, for all that I think he's wrong about just about everything, would attempt to do anything extra legally. I think he would try to do things through the constitutional order and therefore things that you know, would he, they, there are all kinds of checks and balances. It can be, uh, resisted. There's going to be another election afterwards. You can try to correct the mistakes. 
But when you are dealing with someone who does not abide by the Constitution and who already has attempted to overthrow a free and fair election, that's a whole different category and therefore unacceptable. Um, so I present well, that to you. Well, what, I mean, one, I would much rather have Bernie Sanders than Kamala Harris as the Democratic nominee uh, right really? now. OK, Absol- absolutely. Right. And let, just just to say why it sort of goes to point Damon raised right about uh, he was saying that, you know, he would have a real tough time supporting the Kamala Harris of 2019, 2020, who was both sort of all in for, you know, sort of the full spectrum of um, woke positioning and also, you know, had her own, you know, strong illiberal streak again, not promising to overthrow an election or anything like that. But, you know, talking about anti-disinformation efforts that are basically censorship, um, talking about the use of presidential powers on immigration in ways that are, you know, their versions of left wing extremism and sort of left wing Caesarism that she was flirting with. And from my perspective, though, it's not that, oh, Kamala Harris had bad, wild positions in 2020 and now has more moderate positions. And the question is, can we trust her? The issue with Kamala Harris is that I don't think she has substantial positions at all. She's just a creature of the Democratic coalition, a sort of mediocre machine politician who is sort of a conduit through which whatever is happening in liberalism and progressivism is going to sort of move in waves, right? And the reason to prefer a figure like Sanders to her is precisely that Sanders had a bunch of left wing convictions that long predate what I consider the extremely dangerous and destructive mood in progressivism over the last five or 10 years. And so I think of Sanders as someone who's just less likely to be carried away if there's sort of another progressive stampede towards crazy positions, whereas I just have no confidence about that with Harris. Now, you can say, well, look, the reason that stampede happened was, as Damon said, in response to Trump. Right. And I think that's a reasonable case. I've said this before. You know, one of one of the better reasons not to want Trump as president again, if you are a conservative who doesn't like woke progressivism, is that he can heighten that mood and sensibility on the left. But then you're also in a position of essentially being held hostage of liberals saying, oh, you know, you got to vote us in because otherwise we'll go crazy again. Right. Which is a sort of weird. It's a weird position to be in. Right. Like to, to have that to have that perspective. But again, just to finish on your point on your point, Mona, like I I completely agree that there is a baseline expectation of constitutional civic minded behavior that was, you know, Trump rhetorically violated all the time and violated in the most extreme way in January 6th. And that is a completely solid reason to say he should never be president again. That said, there do, I, I do think that at some point, like you could put Trump up against someone be, precisely because Nobody imagines that Trump is going to successfully install. I I don't think anyone seriously imagines. I shouldn't say no one, but I don't seriously imagine that Trump is going to successfully install some kind of totalitarian regime. There do have to be some set of policies that he could be up against that are sufficiently destructive that, you know, you would not wish to support those policies. Right. Like. You know, if if, for instance, if Kamala Harris is running, you know, I'm I'm pro-life, right? Kamala Harris is running the most aggressively pro-choice abortion centric campaign of any Democrat in my lifetime. Now, is that reason enough not to support her? And maybe not on its own. Right. But we are talking from a pro-life perspective about, you know, if Kamala Harris had 51 votes in the Senate, all the pro-life laws in red states would go away and you would have, you know, tens of thousands more unborn lives dead. Like, you know, that's the, the, that kind of thing has to be a consideration in these kind of debates. And so do issues of war and peace. Like we, and again, I don't think it's like any kind of slam dunk that Trump would actually be better on foreign policy. I totally understand. You know, Noah Smith, the, you know, liberal, liberal substacker had this long thing about how he thinks Trump, you know, Trump this time will just sort of concede the world to Russia and China. If you think that you shouldn't vote for Trump. Absolutely. But like, I, 
I just don't think it's clear looking ahead over the next four years to say a vote for Kamala is a vote for a more peaceful and more stable world and a vote for Trump is the opposite. I think there's totally a scenario where a Harris administration is a foreign policy disaster and tens of thousands of people are dead because of it. Like, doesn't that have to factor in at some point to your calculations? Isn't there some <coughs> threshold of potential either global chaos or instability or domestic progressive misgovernment that has to make you uncomfortable with Harris is my question for you. OK, so I'm going to bring Bill back in here on the topic of how uncomfortable people should be or can you know reasonably be about Kamala Harris, um, because the 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 persona that she has presented since July um, is in stark contrast to the 2019 version of herself. Um, and, you know, maybe it's all artificial, but the entire Democratic convention was, you know, seemed to me to be a pitch to the centrist voter. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was amazed at a, how patriotic it was. B, you know, this talk of having the most lethal military on the planet, uh, not the sort of thing I've heard from Democrats in a very long time, maybe since Hubert Humphrey. Um, and, um, so what do you think? I mean, is it, is it all window dressing, Bill, or does this reflect, um, does this better reflect where the Democratic Party is or is headed? I mean, and by the way, let me let me just add one more thing. As the Republican Party has become more America first and less engaged in American world leadership, it seems like there has been, you know, you push down on the balloon here, it pops up there. The Democrats are now taking world leadership much more seriously. What do you think about that? A few points. Number one, as a matter of verbal hygiene, Progressivism is not the intensification of liberalism. It's a break with liberalism, and in many respects, a denial of liberalism. Uh, and I think my party in the waning years of the second decade of the current century had an attack of madness. That's the bad news. The good news is that it's in the process of recovering from that madness. Where is the evidence that the Republican Party is even at the beginning of recovering from what I consider to be its attack of madness? Well, it's a combination of madness and cravenness. There are lots of people in the Republican Party, you know, who are supporting Trump who know that they shouldn't but they're doing it anyway. Not because they think that Kamala Harris would be a horror show, but because if they didn't, their own careers would end. Uh, and then there are the true believers. But where is the evidence that the Republican Party is even in the beginning stages of recognizing that it has abandoned its principles, and its fundamental balance and decency, and that it's time to move back from that. I see no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, and you know, I'd be I'd be interested in you know, Ross honorably cannot support Donald Trump for president, and I assume that that's part of a broader rejection of what I'll call Trumpism. Maybe that's not true, but I'll assume for the sake of argument till Ross speaks that it is. Where is the evidence that the Republican Party is in the early stage of repenting of Trumpism? I mean, I don't think repentance is how these things work. I think that if you imagine some world where Donald Trump is defeated you know, by he had, if he had been defeated by Nikki Haley and then Nikki Haley sets up a truth and reconciliation committee, you know, where Marco Rubio repents in sackcloth and ashes no, for his you're, betrayal. I mean, it's just not that's not how anything works. Look, forget right? forget about politics. the word repentance, Ross. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I guess I guess my view, I guess my view is that if you look at the behavior of 
Republican senators in the Biden administration when there has been, to the Biden administration's credit, more bipartisan legislative activity than there was in the last few, in, in, basically at any point in the Obama era. If you look at, you know, the sort of behavior of Republican governors around the country, if you look at the behavior of, you know, the people who are in charge of elections in states like Georgia in 2020, there's still plenty of normalcy or desire for political normalcy among Republican officials that does not rise to the level of the moral courage that you guys would like to see from them in denouncing and breaking with Donald Trump. But that does suggest that, you know, Trump is not actually, again, the leader of a party that is determined to establish some kind of dictatorship. He's the leader of a party comprised of elected officials, most of whom just want to act like normal American elected officials and have to deal with the fact that their voters really wanted Trump again in 2024. Again, this is not this is not like a great reason to vote for the Republican Party. I certainly concede, but it's also not the same thing as having a political party that is organized like a fascist mass movement in the 1930s or something. It's just not what, you know, the Republican Party of Ron DeSantis and Brian Kemp and, you know, a million other normal elected officials really is. So I, I guess if the question is, you know, is the Republican Party's institutional cravenness and refusal to confront Donald Trump's authoritarian tendencies, you know, bad? Yes, it's bad. Is the Republican Party something where, you know, if Donald Trump disappeared tomorrow, it would be a fascist formation? I, I don't see a ton of evidence of that. And to the extent that there were have been tendencies in that direction, they have been generally defeated by the wisdom of the American people who rejected most of the sort of most Trump imitating and Trump adjacent, you know, January 6th style candidates in 2022. Um, but look, I, I also want to say, like, there's just a lot of fundamental unknowability about what a second Trump term would bring. Like, you know, a second Trump term, it is perfectly possible to imagine a world where in the second Trump term, foreign policy is made by, you know, Tom Cotton as secretary of defense. Right. Who is, you know, maybe not someone who is like your idea of an exemplar of moral heroism, but is also someone who was not a big January 6th guy and I think would be, you know, trying to run a sort of normal Republican foreign policy along lines that, you know, honestly, some folks at the bulwark might be more supportive than, than I would, right? We, we don't actually know who the personnel will be. We don't know what the cabinet will look like. And that unknowability is again a good reason not to want Trump 2.0, but also a good reason not to, you know, assume that like we know what's going to happen in the next four years. And I mean, you know, that it's lights out for American democracy or something like that, which I think you guys have to be able to see why from the point of view of, again, forget me as, you know, an over-informed New York Times columnist from the point of view of, you know, the swing voter who remembers the world being more peaceful and inflation being lower under Trump, the idea that like in four years, the, you know, the extremely old, by the way, <laughs> Donald Trump is going to have, uh, you know, overthrown American democracy. You can see why that argument does not fully persuade, right? Uh, well, that's a big, long discussion all by itself. But Linda... <laughs> You wanted to get in on that. Yeah, I, w I wanted to, to talk about a couple of things that Ross just said. First of all, the idea that we're going to have Tom Cotton as Secretary of Defense, the first time he crosses Donald Trump, he's fired. And we know that from the way Donald Trump behaved in the first term. Uh, Jeff Sessions, uh, who, you know, was his first supporter and who is about as conservative as you can get, wouldn't go along with him on everything he wanted, namely firing, you know, uh, James Comey and a few other things, and he was out. Uh, so th there's no hope uh, that he's going to have an administration of anything but bootlickers. I'm sorry. Um, if they aren't bootlickers, they will not stick, stick around. But I wanted to partially agree with you uh, in terms of Harris. Um, 
I guess my belief is that the Harris of 2019 was not the real Harris, uh, that the, the uh, version, the 2024 version is actually closer to who she is. Um, and some of that is exemplified by some of her history in the past as a prosecutor, as attorney general, et cetera. But there is a concern in terms of the uh, woke uh, element in, in the Democratic Party and what role they will play in a new administration, even under Joe Biden, um, on the issues of race and gender. Um, Biden has been as bad as anyone um, can be. Um, and I don't expect very much, uh, different, uh, from Harris and, and, and I suppose it could, could get worse, but the Republican party, you don't have leadership who is willing to say that Donald Trump, uh, won the election. I mean, when you have the Speaker of the House- Lost the um, election. Sorry, sorry. They're, they're not yeah. willing to say right. he lost. Sorry. Yeah. They are not willing to say that Donald Trump lost the election. And when the Speaker of the House cannot bring himself to say that, and when you have so many uh, Republican members of Congress uh, who in fact tried to go along with the plan to steal the election, I don't have any expectation that I will ever, in what remaining years I have, and it's not as many as you, Ross, uh, given our age difference um, and actuarial tables, uh, I, that I will ever be able to be a Republican again. Doesn't mean I won't vote for Republicans. I just did. I voted for Larry Hogan for for um, U.S. Senate uh, in Maryland, and uh, I just don't see the Republican Party being able to uh, recover in my lifetime. Well, the weather is changing and the nights are getting cooler. But if you want to be sure to sleep comfortably, no matter what the temperature is, you should check out Miracle Maid's bed sheets. Miracle Maid sheets are inspired by NASA and use silver infused fabrics that are temperature regulating so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them cleaner and fresher. So stop sleeping on dirty sheets. Bacteria can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. They are not only clean, but Miracle Made sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. Go to trymiracle.com slash beg to differ to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. Use our promo code beg to differ at checkout to get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident of their product that it's backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash beg to differ and use that code beg to differ to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash beg to differ to treat yourself. We thank Miracle Made for sponsoring this episode. Just uh, briefly on, 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 those, on those points, just to stress again, I, I don't think there is a real Kamala Harris one way or another. I think the quest for the real politician is, again, with the exception of sort of conviction politicians like Sanders is sort of a futile effort. Um, I agree with Bill that, you know, the, the sort of spasm of insanity has on the American left has to some extent receded and God willing will continue to recede. I think on that front, what has changed from my perspective is just about sort of trust, right? It's like, can you trust your political opponents not to very rapidly embrace very destructive ideas? And I think I had much more of that trust around the Democrats five to 10 years ago than I think you can possibly have right now. Um, I don't think, Linda, that you can say that Trump will immediately fire 
anyone who you know who who crosses him in his cabinet. His he I think it's clear that on issues related to his personal scandals and personal legal jeopardy, he will be very quick to uh, you know sort of make turn friends into enemies as he did with Sessions. But really, the story of his first term was filled with cabinet officials staying for long periods of time while and 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 mil and generals, military officials, and so on, while basically not following through on the things that Trump sort of vaguely told them or wanted them to do. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't expect that to happen again because he is a chronically lazy and not you know not especially administratively capable figure. Again, doesn't mean it's good news overall, but I, I would expect that to happen again in some form, at least on some on some issue areas. Um, and just but just just to just to to repeat, I, I think in my from my own perspective, my biggest anxiety about Harris, I have sort of a hierarchy of anxieties and my biggest anxiety by far is the overall condition of the world where, yes, I agree that rhetorically the Democrats have sort of taken up a narrative of American exceptionalism and our role in the world that Republicans have, have let slip. But in terms of practical policies and in terms of competent execution, um, I just I don't have any confidence. I have relatively little confidence in the Biden administration, and I have even less confidence in Harris and her team. And that worry to me exceeds even my concerns about the effects of wokeness, issues like abortion, everything else. Um, if you could if you could show me from a time machine proof that the world is more orderly and peaceful in 2028 than it is in 2024 under President Harris, then, you know, that would get me closer to where you guys would like me to be. Uh, wow. Wow. Um. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, let let me um, the, maybe you can come back and we'll have a whole foreign policy <laughs> discussion <laughs> because we're coming to the end and we have to get to our final segment. Um, but I would like to pose one question to you, Ross. Uh, that it, so we've had a conversation here about both parties having lost, you know, slipped their moorings in some senses over the last number of years. But I'm taking away from this conversation that if you were to compare them and say which party has gone crazier, that you would say it's the Democrats. It, would that be right? I don't. I don't even know. What, what is that? What's that? I don't think that's a meaningful question exactly. I'm trying to count up the costs of different things that I am upset about in American political life. And it's, I think it's a really hard and challenging calculus. I think it's, you know, you can say, as you guys are saying, that there's, you know, something like January 6th is a civic crime that outweighs, you know, any anything else. I, I think that's a, a reasonable argument to make. But I do think that the costs of the period of craziness that, you know, Bill talks about in his party are there's a different kinds of costs, but it is substantial and severe and measurable in actual deaths and serious damage done. Um, so it's not I, I, I'm not trying to like assess sort of the relative insanity of different factions. I'm saying I'm very unhappy with all kinds of different things in both political coalitions. And when I'm thinking about which political coalition I'm trusting with political power, um, I think there's just a lot of different balls in the air and a lot of different uh, possible effects that are not sort of fully distilled by saying Donald Trump is a bad guy with an authoritarian temperament. All right. Uh, we will leave it there. We didn't get even to our second topic because this was a good discussion and I didn't want to cut it off. Um, and uh, so with that, let us turn to our highlight or low light of the week. And I'll start with Bill Galston. Well, I've been so relentlessly negative for so long about everything uh, that I'd like I'd like to offer a highlight rather than a low light. Uh, there's been an enormous amount of discussion about Israel's future. Uh, and in the most recent issue of Foreign Affairs that just came out, a very, very intelligent Israeli 
who is an observer, a careful observer of her own country, a woman by the name of Dahlia Scheinland, uh, published an article in which she argued that there is a relationship between what she regards as Israel's constitution deficit on the one hand, you know, and all the internal problems that have arisen from that, and many of Israel's external problems. And that in order to reach a point of survivable, sustainable stability, uh, the state of Israel is going to have to tackle its internal problems, its basic structural problems with as much ardor, you know, and persistence as its external problems. And it's an argument worth considering. I hadn't heard it before, but it's very interesting. Thank you. Linda Chavez. So I'm going to uh, point to an article from an unlikely source, not my usual source of information, uh, but it was an excellent article uh, in ProPublica. And it's uh, called The Ghosts of John Tanton by Abraham uh, Lusgarten. Uh, it is, uh, John Tanton is a name that I doubt most of our listeners have ever heard before. Uh, he, he was um, an environmentalist. Uh, he was the uh, president of Zero Population Growth, and he was obsessed with the idea of overpopulation. That led him uh, to take on the issue of immigration and to be the founder of what was the anti-immigration uh, movement uh, in the post-1980s uh, era. And this article talks about the way in which uh, radical environmentalists uh, are using climate change uh, as an issue. First of all, they embrace climate change. They think it's real. Uh, but it is about the way in which the right wing um, has the most extreme white wing has in fact um, been able to latch on to this issue and to use it um, in their uh, their war against uh, immigration. And he starts off with the story of Patrick Crucius, probably a name that uh, we don't know, but he is the 21 year old uh, who went uh, to El Paso, Texas, uh, killed 23 people, uh, aided the Mexican Americans. Um, and he did so because um, of his view on uh, climate change in part. So I think it's an article well worth reading. Uh, you'll learn a lot about uh, John Tanton and uh, his role uh, in this very, very powerful movement that he started uh, on immigration. Thank you. Ross Douthat. Uh I'll stick with low lights and just take the thing that I've just been writing a newsletter about, which is a uh, genuinely awful story that appeared uh, in my own newspaper by the technology writer Kevin Roos. Uh, it's the story of a suicide of a Florida teenager named Sewell Setzer III, um, who killed himself at the end of a sort of long spiral into isolation that was mediated by his relationship with uh, AI chatbots, and particularly a chatbot who was named after Daenerys Targaryen from Game of Thrones. Um, it's a story that's just sort of worth reading in its own right as sort of a window into not the technological future, but the technological present. Um, but also maybe given the conversation we've been having sort of a reminder that there are things that are taking shape in our society outside politics um, that are, you know, already changing the way we live and communicate and relate to each other and likely to change it more in in the near future um, that may end up looming even larger than the 2024 presidential election, difficult as that may be to believe. Thank you. Damon Linker. Well, uh, periodically on the podcast, we go off uh, the political, uh, the political, um, focus. And, uh, like a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mona asked us to talk about our favorite recent television show that we've been watching. Um, this is sort of, uh, akin to that, uh, in that I am leaving politics behind, but I want to give a plug to a very good documentary that's on, uh, Max or what used to be called HBO right now, a two-part documentary called Wise Guy, David Chase and the 
Sopranos. Um, for anyone who loved The Sopranos uh, or uh, who needs to learn more about it because you haven't seen it, uh, it's a really, uh, really uh, great, uh, very well done documentary that it really sort of reminded me of what was so great about the show and also gave a very good artistic window into where it came from, how David Chase was able to sort of go off uh, the reservation of commercial network television and do something very unique and uh, had the effect of uh, really inspiring uh, a kind of high water mark of American uh, culture for, uh, you know, maybe a decade there uh, with lots and lots of uh, very powerful, good uh, television that now seems to have waned. Uh, you know, um, Hegel's aesthetic geist or spirit has moved on and will alight elsewhere than television, I think. But for a while, uh, it was TV, and we owe a lot of that to David Chase. So it's a it's a very good documentary, and I highly recommend it. Thank you for that. I will definitely tell my middle son, who is a <laughs> fanatic for David Chase. So, all right, I have a highlight. Uh, which is, for those of you watching on YouTube, you can see this is the cover of The Economist magazine this week. And uh, the, the cover story is about America's economy. And the headline is The Envy of the World. We lose sight uh, all too often, and particularly in a, in a fraught election, uh, where there's such an interest, on certainly on one side, in portraying American life as some sort of hellscape. Um, we lose sight of the fact that we, this country remains extraordinarily strong in many, many ways. Our economy, uh, is, uh, has re recovered more rapidly from the pandemic than peer nations. Um, we are still the richest society on earth and in the history of the world. Um, one statistic that they offer in this piece that's sort of arresting is, that the average income in our poorest state, namely Mississippi, is higher than the average in Great Britain, Germany, and other European countries. Um, we, uh, we are still a juggernaut. People still want to come here, which is a strength, not a weakness. Uh, not saying we should have unrestricted immigration, but uh, the fact that people want to come is, uh, is a sign that we're doing something right. Uh, we are still free and, um, there's a, there's just a lot of meaty stuff in this, this article and this, this series of articles in The Economist and, uh, serves as a reminder of, um, you know, what we should be grateful for. Uh, and there's so much, uh, denigration of America. And so it was a nice, reminder of our strengths. Well, thank you all. Thanks, Ross Douthat, for joining us and being a good sport about all the vigorous disagreement, and we hope you will come back. Uh, I also want to thank our regulars, as well as our producer, Jim Swift, and of course, our readers are sorry, and of course, our listeners and viewers on YouTube. Thank you so much. Beg to Differ will return next week, as every week. <laughs>